One thing I like to work with a lot are my fingers. Um, I like to work with my fingers more so, th you know, than, than a lot of other players just because what it allows me to do is get a different sound, almost like a more percussive effect that you couldn't get with the pick, you know? Um, <laughs> by combining the two, you can ultimately kind of come up with something that's really cool. Um, the pick is definitely, you can play very fast with the pick, and it definitely helps for hitting things dead on. For a <laughs> that you don't really get to do with your fingers, but your fingers can work great for doing different things. For example, incorporating a, a bass line into your playing. Um, um, I do that, I the new song on the Hair Pick, which I, the Hair Pick album, which is my third solo record. Um, if you listen to the rhythm track of it, you'll notice there's always a bass line going throughout the whole thing. It's kind of, um... And um, by working with your fingers, you just get a different sound. It's almost more of a kind of a personal sound, and you know... Another reason for using my fingers is that um, also greatly helps me in working with dynamics. And I think dynamics is something that's very important because ultimately, um, if you come out on 10 and you play on 10 the whole night, by the time the show's over, it's considered to be a fairly boring show, which is sad but true. So with that in mind, it helps to kind of give a little bit of variation. For example, if you're doing a ballad song and then you come cranking out with a lead that's very loud and you know very over the top, it makes much more of an impression, you know, rather than if it were on a much crazier, heavier song. So these are things I like to work with, and I think my fingers, because it tends to give me a little bit more control over the note, really seems to help, especially for, for chords and stuff like that. Um, dynamics um, you can always rely on your equipment for example um, now I don't particularly do this and we'll get into this a little bit later with the equipment but um, certain players use different kinds of you know different presets and patches if they have this you know um, foot switchable stuff um, you can rely on your equipment as far as getting different types of dynamics I tend not to because uh, <laughs> the only true common factor in any of the gigs I've ever played is that nothing ever really works so with that in mind I've tried to keep things really basically as simple as possible and always kind of Relied, relied way more on myself than I have on um, of any of my equipment. But like I said, some people can turn down the volume knob. Some people switch to you know have single coil pickups and switch from humbuckers to single coils, and that also helps kind of drop stuff down. But I typically tend to shy away from that just due to the fact that um, it never really works for me. So with that in mind, that's um, just yet another way you can also work with. Um, dynamics and, and things like that. Now, as far as other things, um, which is a big factor of it, is the equipment, and I think it's something that needs to be covered. <laughs> As far as equipment, I mean, here's the basic rule. I mean, <laughs> there really is no basic rule, and it gets down to this. Ultimately, what is truly going to work for yourself? And that's really the bottom line as far as anything else. What works for me may not work for you, and what works for the person next to you may not work for me. Um, so with that in mind, it's basically a very expensive trial and error period if you really haven't discovered your sound. Um, for example, I knew ultimately that I wanted to 
you know, I knew the basic sound I was going for. I wanted a, you know, fairly distorted sound that was pretty easy to play, but at the same time I wanted it clean so that you could hear the difference between all the chords. For example, if I do, you know, if I'm playing a chord and I drop down a note, I want to be able to hear it. I wanted something that was very crunchy and yet clean for um, rhythms, but at the same time had the punch and was able to get through with the leads, and that was also something that was important, kind of, um, kind of one of the best of both worlds. Now, not only did I want to kick through with the leads, kind of like... <laughs> And um, not only did I want to cut through with the leads, but I also wanted uh, to be very smooth at times, yet very abrasive at other times. For example, I wanted to be punchy enough to cut through for a rhythm thing, so it's kind of like... But at the same time, I wanted it to be ultra smooth, and I wanted a very kind of smooth, warm neck pickup sound. And at the same time, I had to kind of find a way to, at the, you know, when I turned the setup down. I also wanted it to go clean. So as you can see, I don't rely on anything else with the exception of what I have at my hands. And just out of pure necessity, it works best for me. Um, so the way I kind of figured out was, uh, first I had to figure out what kind of guitar I wanted to play, and that brings me to my guitar. The guitar I'm playing is a, a Samick, and it's a um, brand new guitar that I pretty much custom made by myself. What I did is I sat at home and drew out exactly what I wanted and this is actually a prototype and the model, there is going to be a model, a series actually of guitars coming out and it's a little bit different this, than this one. It's got an extended piece here and it's got a couple body contours but this is the very very first prototype and basically what it is is the body's made of alder which is a pretty warm pretty smooth wood that works really good for you know what I wanted. The neck is made out of maple and I wanted it for the bite. It kind of really helps, especially for cording. Um, I use very big frets, huge frets, like jumbo frets, pretty much. And the reason being is because so much of my sound comes from my uh, left hand anyway, so I figured, you know, it just makes it a lot easier to bend. I remember, like, 10 years ago when they, um, when I first started playing, they had uh, guitars with really small frets. So it was really hard to bend. So I've got pretty big, like almost like Jim Dunlop 6100s on here. Um, I use two humbuckers, and I've just always pretty much used it. I've experimented with single coils, and it never really worked for the type of sound that I wanted to go for, um, which was a pretty straightforward rock and roll sound. And ultimately, I'm running two humbuckers. Um, they're Seymour Duncan pickups, and what it is, it's a custom model pickup that I have out. Um, it's called a blues trembucker. And um, it's wound very close to a PAF, and it keeps the guitar very natural and clean sounding. And that's something that really helps a lot because if you just if you have a totally distorted sound coming from your guitar, it's hard to get anything clean out of it. Whereas it's a lot easier to make it more distorted. So that's how I kind of came about with that. Um, like like I said, I have one volume knob and a three-way switch, and it's pretty much wired uh, bridge, bridge, and then neck. Because if you watch, I always ultimately I'm always switching between these two pickups, especially even a lot of uh, in between a lot of licks I'll start off with the bridge pickup. And I'll kind of start very high on the bridge pickup, work my notes lower, end up on the neck pickup. And what it kind of does, it just almost makes it a greater array of kind of what I'm doing. And it also freaks the sound man out a lot, so so it's pretty cool to do. Um, uh, another thing about it is that, like I said, I've got a Floyd on this guitar because my style is just kind of revolved around playing with tremolos. I like them because it allows me to kind of overcompensate for things working with the tremolo. Um, a lot of disadvantages to working with the tremolo also because it'll, um, you know, you, you can't do a lot of the, a lot of the bending. It makes the strings go flat a lot of times, but um, you find ways of compensating for that. Sometimes I rest my hand on the bridge. Sometimes, you know, I will just um, play around it almost, and so that's a, a big part of it. And ultimately, all I really do is run um, my guitar straight into my amplifier, which is back there. Um, the amp's a pretty special thing, and that has a lot to do with my sound. And I think a lot of people don't realize that ultimately you are totally, completely, and truly influenced by your sound. For example, if somebody gave me a telly through a clean amp, um, realistically, I'd probably play a lot differently than I do now. And so, which also works well, because a lot of times in the writing process, by working with different uh, different pieces of equipment allows me to write different songs and so I kind of get inspired by different guitars and different pieces of equipment because it throws you in a different mood um, and allows you to play differently. But ultimately the amp is a pretty special thing. It's an amp that my father actually custom made for me. It's um, a Dirty Boy amplifier. It's one of a kind and basically the, the story behind the amp, it's a very simple principle that's kind of been um, 
taken to the, to the, to the farthest region of what we could do. Um, I always liked distortion, but I always used to use older amps where I would turn them up and let the power section really work, more so than the preamps. Everybody today has got these huge racks with all these preamps and stuff, and um, that's how they get their sound. Mine's pretty much backwards. I get my sound mostly from the power amp, and the preamp um, has less to do with it. So ultimately, what you'll see on the back of that amp, if you can zoom up on it, um, is that there's a big knob. And what that knob ultimately does is control the voltage, but in a much different way than a standard Variac controls it. Um, I guess your regular amplifier, a lot of people take their amp, plug it into a Variac and try and achieve the same sound. And the amp was designed that only certain part of the amps work on that control. And it's basically a very complex thing that ultimately just allows the guitar to sound great. You'll notice I've got it down to about 40, which means I'm probably running at about, I don't know, maybe 60 volts right now. But um, the amp is excruciatingly loud. And it's also probably the most versatile amp I've ever worked with. So especially on my um, third solo record hair pick, you'll you'll definitely be hearing the amplifier. And um, like I said, this is the stuff that I use. And the reason why I use it you know, is pretty much very simple. It's my trial and error has pretty much led me to kind of work with that. I know that in a clinch you know, situation where everything is failing, these two things always come out the same. I like really big necks on guitars. And I like amplifiers that are really loud and pretty clean, yet distorted enough to really rock out. So. Um, and that's what my experience has led me to believe. Um, the best way, I, the best advice I could ever give you is realistically, um, you're going to have to pretty much go through that process yourself and decide whether you're going to work with single coils or, you know, humbuckers or where you want to place it. And like I said, just keep in mind that there there is no rule. The most expensive guitar is not by far not necessarily the best guitar for you. You have to decide ultimately what's going to work best for you. Actually, another topic that I'm uh, very often asked about is uh, practicing and exercises. Well, I don't really practice much, so I can't really tell you much about that. But I can tell you about exercises, because at one time, I did do some. So with that in mind, um, the exercises I used to do were pretty much simple. Um, my biggest thing is I wanted to get my right hand up to, up to par, because I think that was um, what was the most impressive, even though all my sound seems to come from my left hand. Um, what I would do is ultimately take a pattern, it could be any pattern, and I would just start slow and um, ultimately build it up. I would try and take a hard pattern that was very hard to me and try and get it um, not necessarily fast but clean. I was more into being a clean player than I was a fast player because everybody around me was really fast and not very clean. So with that in mind, I took a simple pattern kind of like, um, well, I mean, something like a, a one three five spread, ultimately like... Um, What I would do is kind of take that and ultimately move it up and down the neck, kind of like a. And then I would take it, you know. And then I would just keep slowly but surely moving it up. And like I said, that's something that'll come basically just through repetition. Um, best thing I can tell you about exercising is don't try and do anything too fast, too quick, because ultimately it never, never works out. So take a, um, an exercise and basically start slow. And it can be any pattern. For example, a lot of people, um, the one I like to work with a lot is just uh, something I made up. And it's really, it's not necessarily a musical thing as much as it's just an exercise thing. <laughs> Like I said, as far as picking goes, I, you could try starting slow and building up, for example, on a tremolo thing, which is a pretty standard thing. You can kind of... Okay, um, another exercise that I try working with is I try taking a pattern and then I try and work it into more of a musical thing. And it's not necessarily to play it as fast as you can, it's just something that kind of... Uh, ultimately worked out to me actually be a part in the song for the, if you listen to the um, first track on the, on the hair pick record on the song Stinky Kitty it's got a, um, a part that was originally just an exercise and I ended up turning it into part of the song like this um. <laughs> A lot of people
people always pointed out the fact that I did point the pick and that the pick is shaved. The pick part, I got, I, I saw another player play and I really liked the, the way that person played. So ultimately, I took and filed the pick and I tried um, playing with it and it was terrible. I was like, this totally sucks. Why would anyone want to file their pick? And um, I tried it for about two days. I figured, let me at least give myself enough time to fully try and make it happen. I couldn't get it to work for me, so I went to go back to a regular shape pick and I hated it. It was like worse than I've ever played, so I've just kind of gotten almost like addicted to playing with the point. And ultimately what it really does is make, um, it makes it harder to play, if you can believe that or not. But, which is fine, because when you're out in front of people and you're playing, and if the guitar is too easy to play, I fall over it sometimes. Sometimes I need the guitar, you know, that's why I keep the action so high on it, and that's why I keep my pick pretty pointed, because it just makes it a little bit, um, ultimately uh, harder to play. Um, and also another thing is people always point out the angle of the way I pick and it just came about because I, each, every player had a different, you know, feel. Van Halen would come up and he would just like kind of like hit over the top of it. Um, and there were other players that would kind of pick in circles. And I, the only way I could really ever get anything to the fastest I could possibly pick is when I did the tremolo thing and when I kept my hand pretty rigid. So therefore it's kind of how I developed this really um, weird way to play and I can't, you know, once again you just fall into a groove and it's not necessarily the correct way but it just kind of works for you and it's the most, um, it's the way I could play the fastest one I wanted to but at the same time because I would hit the guitar so hard you know, uh, a lot of people don't realize it but if, you know, I'm just hitting the strings so hard when I'm playing because I typically used to not really play with a lot of gain or a lot of anything but pure volume and you'd always have to really hit the guitar as hard as you could to get it to work for you so that's ultimately how I came out with it and um, I really think as long as you position your right hand somewhere, it really helps. Some people position it up here on the guitar. Some people, you know, put their fingers out and use their palm. But ultimately, because I had a tremolo on the guitar, I could never rest my palm on it. Otherwise, it would get... I always had really bad tuning problems. So ultimately, what I would do is um, position my uh, hand either with this finger or my middle finger, and I would pick everything around it, and it just kind of helped. If I wasn't, you know, really coming down on it, I would position my hand. So, um, and I wasn't even aware of that until I saw a picture of myself playing because these are things you just um, develop without even realizing it. you also notice I keep my thumb over the guitar a lot and I tend not to use my pinky, which everybody painfully points out to me. Um, I do use it, but I use it more on the, you know, on the arpeggiated stuff. Like because that's ultimately where um, my pick, you know, that's where I kind of needed it for the stretching. Because I have fairly, you know, large size hands, um, it made it, I could always compensate with moving this finger over, which kind of formed a bad habit. But ultimately, I just picked it up. And I picked using my thumb over it because I was always bending so much and I wanted to get to strength. The only problem with um, keeping your thumb behind the neck perfectly is one, when you stand up, your guitar is so much lower that you don't seem to have as much strength and you can't have quite as much control over bending the notes. And because I really like to really have a pretty wide vibrato. <laughs> Because I, you know, pretty much played like that, I always kept my thumb over it. And it was really good because when I was doing a lot of the bluesier stuff, it really worked out for me. And it also kind of helped when I was doing a lot of, um, when I would try and get percussive with my playing, I kept my thumb over it because it also helped me mute a lot of the strings. <laughs> You also notice when I'm doing a lot of that stuff, it's all downstrokes with the pick. When I'm doing a lot of... And as far as uh, other exercises, um, you'll notice everything we've kind of worked with today on this tape, I've tried to keep as close to a pentatonic scale as I can because ultimately um, to give people too much it one shot kind of sometimes works against you. So with that in mind, um, there's other things you can work with. Like I said, keep in mind everything we've done has been really basically really close to the pentatonic, almost that blues boxy scale. Now in order to get away from that, what you ultimately have to do is find different scales that are going to work for you. And the problem is, is that um,